you, Larry. My, my session, my talk is going to be a little bit different than some of the others I've heard. So let me start off, if you don't mind, with a question. A show of hands, how many of you have experienced a cyber attack on your industrial control systems in your organization? I see one hand, two, okay. And then the question, second question is, of those, how many of you have publicly reported the details of those attacks? I see fewer hands going up. And so the question then is, why or why not? Do one of you want to comment why you didn't make public disclosure details of what the attack was about? Go ahead. Either one? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I don't have to. What? I don't have to. You don't have to, exactly. So there's typically a three reasons I talk to people about. Actually, that's actually reason four. The first thing the lawyers say is, say nothing. The other reason is you don't want to possibly harm your reputation by having people realize that somehow you were subject to attack. Number two, you don't want to encourage copycats. Say, well, this looks like an easy place to go. And thirdly, you don't want to have to deal with lawsuits that often drag on for years afterward. Now, the reason I bring that up is, of course, you know, how do we learn? Well, we hear about attacks, not too many of them. Some of the big ones we hear in the news, such as the Turkish pipeline, the German steel mill, there was a bit more detail about the Ukrainian power, uh, I attended some briefings on that, the Florida water treatment facility and such. And of course, some of the ones that got a lot of news coverage, oops, I'm sorry, like the Colonial Pipeline, it really wasn't an attack on the OT system as far as uh, everything I know, it just was a kind of, I call it a uh, collateral damage, if you will, to a ransomware attack on the central system. So what I'm gonna do for a few minutes here is raise a few things, I, I'll call them myths. Now, myths means things that many people, maybe not the people in the audience here today, but many people kind of take for granted that I question, if you will. The, the first one is, you, how many people have heard the saying in the newspapers, the bad guys have the advantage because they only need to find one unlocked door. How many people have heard that somewhere or other okay, in the press? Okay? And there is some element of truth to it. I actually say that sometime when I'm in an audience, just want to kind of get rolling. But I think the opposite is actually true. Because as we'll see, and I'll talk about some examples, in order to really succeed with a cyber attack, they have, don't have to find one unlocked door, they have to find a bunch of unlocked doors and very specific unlocked doors, which is a lot more work. It's nowhere near as easy as it sounds, if you will. But I'll give you some examples of that. The other things you'll often see in the headlines is, this should not have happened. Or a variation on that, it was a complete surprise. Well, my, my, I have two several points here. One, if that was not supposed to happen, what had they did done, if you will, to make sure it never did happen? Okay. It, secondly, if you issue we got a complete surprise, we had no warning. For example, in the Colonial Pipeline, I don't know how many people watched the episode of his testimony in front of Congress. I believe he said something to the effect, oh, we had never considered the possibility that anybody ever wanted to do a ransomware attack on us. Now, is it, he had, is it he had never heard of the existence of ransomware? You know, has he been hiding under a rock for the last decade or two? But the point is, well, that would never happen to us. So in other words, there were evidence, warning signs out there in the, you know, in the wild, but they just were not paid attention to. We're going to argue that most cyber attacks succeed due to lack of control. And I like the preceding speaker said something very important I want to highlight also. In our research, we find most cyber attacks occur when there is a change. You know, you've had 40 years of experience with this or that. You've had an hour and a half experience with this new thing you've just installed. And that 40 years of other experience doesn't help you a lot. So a lot of these surprises occur because you hadn't considered what kinds of things could happen with the new things. So I'm going to briefly talk about something we've been developing in my group at MIT that we call cyber safety. It's basically a method for analyzing incidents and understanding in what way the controls behave the way they did. If you think about it, whenever something is reported, and there aren't that many things reported, you'll hear a, quite a bit or a bit about the what happened. Our plant was shut down, or something potentially dangerous happened. You hear maybe a teeny weeny bit about how it happened. Well, there was a defective X, Y, Z, or someone clicked on something they shouldn't but very little of what I call about the why. What were the circumstances that made that all possible? 
almost nothing goes into that. So I'm going to share with you some of our research going behind the scenes. And we discovered lots of things in many uh, 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 studies we have done. Uh, the, the cyber safety method involves a variety of things. I'm not going to go through the details and bore you about them, but I do want to talk about these steps here about building a safety control structure. What I mean by that, and many of you, of course, have engineering backgrounds, so maybe this is something you'll all appreciate, if you will. In our view, everything that goes on in your organization is a process. Of course, the process could be mechanical, could be electronic, could be computerized, or it could be human. And in general, for every process that you have, there is some kind of controller that controls the process, monitors the process, and makes it sure it's doing the right things. And of course, if you think about it, that controller is a process also, whether it be mechanical or human or electronic. And so there is a controller for the controller, et cetera, et cetera. And that leads to a hierarchy of controls in the organization, from very detailed level things that are being controlled to some wider, broad-ranging things that are being controlled. I'm now share with you a third myth. And once again, you may see this in headlines in the reports you may have seen. Most reports focus on a single or often a very few faults that led to a cyber attack. Let me share with one that you may have heard of at the time. This happened about four or five years ago. Equifax was an insurance, I mean, a, a credit reporting agency. They suffered a cyber attack that affected 143 million US and Canadian customers, probably many of you here. The headline pointed out that criminals exploited a US website application vulnerability to gain access. And that's the report that came out of the uh, Equifax people. So what it sounds like, if you think about it, the take takeaway is, well, we made a simple mistake. The example I use, we forgot to lock the back door. None of us are perfect. It was a minor mistake. We've locked the back door. Everything is hunky-dory now. And that's the way most stories end. They identify you know, that, that uh, Dan over there clicked on something he shouldn't have clicked on. We slapped his rich. He's never going to do that again. Problem solved. That's what you'll see in the press. So let me go on to talk about what we've learned. By the way, this is the... Uh, the CEO of Equifax testifying to Congress. I have similar, I didn't have the video of it, of the a CEO of a, pipe, a colonial pipeline testifying, commenting how we never considered the possibility of it. So this is the Equifax hierarchical control shock. So it is not obviously an OT system, but the things I'm going to point out, I want you to think about the things I'm going to point out, and almost all of them, I think, probably apply to many of your own system. This is a very detailed diagram. I'm not going to go through it, but the thing I do want to highlight here, we identified not one, not two, but 19 control failures. 19 places where things, quote, should not have happened, but were allowed to happen. And I'm going to go through them briefly just by kind of grouping them into four areas. I'm not going to cover all 19 of them, but see if any of these things sound familiar to things that might or could happen in your organization. Let me start off here very much at the bottom of the picture, if you will. One of the things they did, and I'm sure many of you have various types of monitoring facilities, firewalls, and so on. Basically, they called it their intrusion detection and prevention system. It monitored all traffic going in and out of their systems to make sure nothing suspicious or bad was happening. Is that not a good idea to do? I'm sure many of you have things like that in your organization. But it turns out, this is a picture of it here, it's monitoring the traffic, but in order to get access to the traffic, it had to have an SSL certificate. Not uncommon with firewalls and such. But there was one minor detail. The certificate had expired nine months earlier. Now, I don't know how many of you deal with this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. At MIT, my MIT certificate expires on July 31st each year. I gotta remember, or I get a warning message to renew it each year, probably sometime in the middle of July. And if you're a small company or an individual, it's something you kind of have to keep track of. But you're a large organization. I think they have 5,000 people in their IT department with several hundred, if not several thousand certificates because they have hundreds of systems interacting with each other. You know, keeping track of which certificates have to be renewed on what basis is not exactly something easy to do. So basically, that thing at the bottom called a traffic analyzer was a brick sitting there doing nothing for nine months. 
while the cyber attack was going on. Now, you say, well, gee whiz, remember I said before, oops. Well, first thing, if you go to any website today and ask about SSL certificates, says one thing we recommend if you're a large organization is you have some kind of centralized management facility to keep track of the thousands of certificates you have to make sure you know which ones need to be renewed and when they need to be renewed. Furthermore, even within Equifax itself, various people in the department had said, by the way, guys, we know this is very error prone. We know it, Casey, we slip up. We should put in a system to help us. And they said, sounds like a good idea. We'll think about it next year, because that's obviously not something we need to worry about right now. So that's the first level. The next one here, and once again, you are operating in different industries, water, electricity, and so on. You all have industry standards for doing things. This is a little different. This is credit reporting, but there is something called, let me see, get up here now. Okay, well, the, thing, the bottom you see, ACES, is the automated customer interview system. If you have a complaint, this is how you interact with them. You file your complaint. You give everything, your name, your address, your firstborn child, your, your shoe size, everything you give to the system there. In the industry, there is something here called PCI DSS. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, just like there are water industry standards and electric industry standards. And basically it says, what are the things you should do to adequately protect the information and so on? And each year there is an audit done to investigate to see how well you comply with those standards. That ACS system was not included in the audit. It did accept credit card numbers. By definition, it should be included in the audit. Well, one of the reasons it may not have been included was when you actually audited afterward, they found it failed all 12 PCI DSS requirements. So one way to solve it is say, it's not required to be PCI audited, so don't even look at it. And that way, you don't have to worry about dealing with a report that tells you that you failed 12 different times on that order. <sighs> okay, let's go on now. Okay, and of course, you know, they knew it, they, they, not that it's a secret to them, they know it handled credit cards, they know it should be audited, they just chose not to audit it. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, the other issue, the one thing I did mention in the news report, it talked about the failure of that system because there was a known vulnerability that had been reported, I believe, two years earlier in the software. And it should have been patched. They never got around to it. And of course, the other thing the organization, in various internal reports highlighted, that they were doing a very poor job of patching vulnerable software. So it wasn't a secret. No, not to everybody in the organization, though, but many people in the organization know that this is something we're doing that really is very risky and nobody paid attention to it. I'll just do one more. I don't want to take too much of your time. This was kind of interesting. I call these more management failures. Let me go for a couple of them here, if you will. So one of the reasons by why they postponed or didn't do certain things, this ACS, as I mentioned, was going to be replaced. They had plans for a new, improved version. And the new, improved version would have lots of things in it that possibly would have mitigated those risks. Of course, this new improved version had been deferred for two years so far and was still being deferred in the future. So basically it's like saying, well, the back door is wide open, but we're going to replace the kitchen eventually, so let's not worry about the back door being wide open. Okay. Think about the logic behind that. Uh, let's see what else. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, PCI, this is a fun question. PCI DSS, I mentioned, is an industry standard. But it's not required by any law. Actually, it turns out I think Nevada does require it. But in general, it's not a legal standard, a legal requirement. It's just a recommendation by the industry. But think about it. The industry partners, in this case here, credit card partners, the ones who process your credit card, they can tell whether you're doing all the things, or at least some of the things, according to the standard. So Visa and MasterCard and so on realized that they were not doing things according to the standard. They could have said, we're going to shut you down. We're not going to take any of your credit card payments. They didn't. Why didn't they shut them down? Anybody want to speculate? Anybody? That, Sid. They didn't want to lose the business. These are the customers. This is a classic issue. And once again, it covers every industry. 
a lot of times the auditors, whether it be you know, uh, accounting auditors, if you will, or other, often are being paid for by you. And if they, I heard of many companies, they shop for auditors, if you will. That this auditor is very tough, and they're going to find all kinds of troubles for us. Let's go to this auditor. He's very sloppy, same price or even cheaper, and he won't give us a hard time. So we have a lot of cases where we have dysfunctional activities going on out there. Uh, and then finally, even within the company, at various points of time, these things, remember, these are, most of these things were not secrets. Most things had risen, risen up, maybe only one part of the company, maybe only certain parts of it. There are many cases where they, they, they actually had an audit committee as part of the board of directors. They had a technology committee and board of directors. Neither one of them was responsible for cybersecurity. Now, it doesn't mean they weren't kind of vaguely aware of it, but neither one had it. In other words, by having those two committees, they allowed a gap to form when nobody was responsible for it. And just to give you an idea of the consequences, in this particular case, it only cost them $1.3 billion, equal of more than one-third of the total revenue. Not profits, equal to one-third of the total revenue of the company just disappeared. Now, not right away. Some of it had to do with replacing the systems. Some had to do with, with uh, various government agencies finding them. Some having to do, I think, a $100 million class action suit by the 130 million of you who basically, you get $5 and the law, lawyers get all the money. Uh, so basically, when you added it all up, the cost of the company was, was over $1.3 billion. Finally, now once again, I realize I don't want to ask a show of hands how many of you are members of the board of directors of your company or not, probably not too many of you, but I want to give you an idea because a lot of times we focus down on the nitty gritty and don't really see, as, as I think our previous speaker mentioned, the big picture of how things fit together. So it's very important that the board understands enterprise-wide risk. They need to understand the legal implications. I don't know how many of you are familiar with recent SEC regulations that now is holding boards of directors personally liable for security failures of their organization. Okay. So in other words, the, the, the bullet is coming really at the top executives in your company because, as one executive said, that's the only way to get the others to wake up. They hit them over the head with a two by four in some cases. Uh, here's a question I want you, you may want to think about and look at. This happens to be, a, a not this, in the past, this was voluntary. The SEC regulations are now going to make this mandatory. So for each of the member of the board of directors, you have to indicate what are their technical or what are their, their expertise levels. I want you to notice right here on the Equifax board, the, the level that was least experienced on the board of directors was cybersecurity. Okay. Holding cocktail parties and other things are very high on the list of capabilities of the board of directors. So these are the kinds of things that need to go into the organization. So finally, wrap up. First thing, I don't want your company to be the next case study, unless you want to volunteer it. I appreciate that if you can. Learning from these, as the previous person talked about, kind of what you saw as concerns, but these are even worse. These are what actually happened. I've learned time and time again no matter how much you anticipate what can happen, the reality is always much bigger, much messier than anything you could ever imagine. Okay? So that's why you really need to learn from these things. This particular approach, not the only approach, but the cyber safety approach makes you ask you, for all those things that should not happen, what have you done to ensure they do not happen? Because almost always we hear that phrase, it should not have happened but you've then realized that nobody bothered to worry about how to make sure it didn't happen or try to make sure that. And it's very much important to go beyond uh, just you know, blaming it for, you know, for Dan clicking on the wrong link or something. There's usually, and every, we've looked at about six different cyber attacks in quite a bit of depth. They're hard to get. Usually only the ones that actually have to go to court and all the documents, tens of thousands of documents can reveal, do you really know what really happened? But almost every time that we actually had a chance to go into them, the actual situation was not using a single failure, it was multiple failure, and usually ranged in the dozens. In this case, it was 19 failures we discovered. So I want to thank you all. If anybody's interested, oh, let me get back here again. Uh, uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, if you're interested, there was a report we have that goes into great detail. There was a short article in the Wall Street Journal. In, in that article, I, I came up with an interesting new phrase I used, which I call semi-conscious decision making. What I mean by that is a decision made like, we will postpone this to next year. So a decision was made, but no one said, okay, what are the possible consequences of that decision? 
So they looked at one half, the benefit of making that decision, but never looked at what risk or cost that decision might make. We've got to move away from that and really analyze our decisions and make sure we understand the consequences. Thank you all.